Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless you may have heard the phrase god's hand of protection it seems that it is something god would do keep a person or nation in the shelter of his hand it also seems logical to think that in his fierce wrath and anger that he would lift his hand but is it biblical yes it is jeremiah 18 7 through 10 the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to pluck up, to pull down, and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. And the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to build and to plant it, if it does evil in my sight so that it does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good with which I said I would benefit it. In the news these days, we read about and see devastating events, each more unusual, destructive, and unprecedented than the last. They are happening more frequently and more intensely, just as the Bible said would happen just before the return of Jesus Christ. Devastating weather in Tennessee. More than 20 people are dead. Dozens are missing after extreme flooding this weekend. At least 15 inches of rain fell. Humphreys County, an hour west of Nashville, was hardest hit. Jerika, the wall of water came rushing into towns like this so fast. For some, there was no escape. <laughs> A massive search and rescue operation is underway in hard hit Humphreys County, Tennessee, after flash flooding struck Saturday. I call 911 and they tell me that I need to get to hash grounds. A record 17 inches of rain. That's about one third of the total yearly rainfall in the entire state. I heard pop, pop, pop. All these houses started moving. It did more than swamp some rural communities. Yeah. Tells me they want to start over. In McEwen, outside Nashville, anxious residents waited to be rescued. We were on the roof of our house and hoping that we were going to make it. We're alive. Thank you, Jesus. In nearby Waverly, the local school completely flooded. Tonight, search and rescue teams are searching for the dozens of people still missing, including children. We're standing along the Trace Creek here that cuts through the middle of Waverly. This weekend, it turned into a machine of destruction, knocking out bridges like this one. And you can see things that are not supposed to be here. There's a boat and on the other side, multiple people's homes. On top of it all, there's a car up there and it's just a snapshot of what the flood left behind. It is heartbreaking to see. Tennessee Governor Bill Lee said the aftermath of the flooding is a devastating picture of heartache. Tremendous loss of life, a number of uh, missing people on the ground, uh, homes washed off their foundations, cars strewn around the community. In the city of Waverly, roads turned into rivers, the water destroying anything in its path. Several children were swept away. Floodwaters ripped twin babies, Ryan and Riley, out of their father's arms. Their bodies later recovered. Also recovered, the body of a longtime friend and ranch foreman for country music legend Loretta Lynn. He was swept away in waters that overtook her ranch in nearby Hurricane Mills. Lynn posted on her Facebook page, only God could build a man like Wayne Spears. Meanwhile, among the missing, two-year-old Kellen, snatched away from his mother and four siblings. They were on the clotheslines hanging on. It was a wonderful time. The rain fell so quickly, many people were caught off guard by the danger. Amber Elliott climbed to the roof of her car with her children. All the houses down this way are off foundation. There's cars in the driveway. The scariest thing ever for me and my kids to be in being a single mom. My mama being rescued. And amid the tragedy emerged stories of heroism. Neighbors helping rescue neighbors, even by jet ski. Water is the most powerful natural force on earth. And over the weekend, an unending deluge of it 
tore through communities in Middle Tennessee. There's houses moved off their foundation, cars and trees. This is almost a biblical proportions here, like a massive tornado come through here. Some parts of the state recording more than a foot of rain in just a matter of hours, leaving vehicles strewn across lawns and wedged up sideways against trees. So what we have is unfolding right now, a very tragic and difficult situation. The vicious flash floods have already claimed more than 20 lives. Look at the power of what it did. Steel sign on the bridge here, totally bent. One man in Waverly narrating through a scene of destruction. Another upside down vehicle. Surreal and sorrowful with neighbors consoling one another. First responders combed through communities looking for more than two dozen people still missing. For many on the ground, the painful search is personal. I just went and got one of my best friends. It's recovered him when he was got he drowned in this, and uh, it's uh, sitting here thinking about that. Yeah, it's tough, but we're gonna move forward. With the shock of the flooding still setting in, my whole blob is history. Houses washed them down. I mean, this is no lie. Residents in four counties that experienced catastrophic conditions are buoyed by the return of cell phone service, which has led to more survivors and fewer people missing. We have had several calls this morning, uh, people reporting in to us that they have found some of the people that we had on our list. So praise God, we've, we've been very fortunate. We hope that continues throughout the day. We need a lot of Jesus. Clayton Calicott is a junior high principal who's helping his neighbors who lost their homes. Unfortunately, the ones are still missing. Some of those are children. Um, and we just trust God's hand that he's going to minister and take care of and heal our community. Why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? We live in a world full of pain and suffering. And there is no one, including Christians, who are not affected by the hard realities of life. The question, why do bad things happen to good people? is one of the most difficult questions in all of theology. God is sovereign, so all that happens must be allowed by Him, if not directly caused by Him. We must understand that human beings cannot expect to fully understand God's thoughts and ways as we read in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. In the book of Job, Job was a righteous man, yet he suffered in ways that none of us can even imagine, as we read in Job 1.1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. God allowed Satan to do everything he wanted to Job except kill him, and Satan did his worst. What was Job's reaction? Job's reaction was to trust God and to bless him. Job. 121 and he said naked i came from my mother's womb and naked shall i return there the lord gave and the lord has taken away blessed be the name of the lord job 13:15. though he slay me yet will i trust him even so i will defend my own ways before him job didn't understand why god had allowed the things he did but he knew god was good and therefore continued to trust in him that should be a believer in Jesus' reaction as well. As hard as it is to acknowledge, we must admit to ourselves that we are sinners and there are no good people, as we read in Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Even on your best day, we are like filthy rags, as we read in Isaiah 64.6. But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind, have taken us away. Bad things may happen to good people in this world, but this world is not the end. Christians have an eternal perspective, as we read in 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Bad things happen to good people, but God uses those bad things for good, as we read in Romans 8.28.
And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Bad things happen to good people, but those bad things equip believers for deeper ministry, as we read in 2 Corinthians 1, 3-5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Bad things happen to good people, and the worst things happen to the best person. Jesus is the only truly righteous one, yet he suffered more than we can imagine, and we should follow in his footsteps, as we read in 1 Peter 2, 20-23. For what credit is it if, when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Romans 5.8 declares, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Despite our sinful nature, God still loves us. God loves the world so much that he sent his only begotten son to die for us, as we read in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God allows things to happen for a reason. Whether or not we understand his reasons, we must remember that God is good, just, loving, and merciful. Psalm 135.3 Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praises to his name, for it is pleasant. Bad things happen to us that we simply cannot understand. Instead of doubting God's goodness, our reaction should be to trust him. As we read in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. And now to the northeast where the flood threat continues as Henri slowly turns its way through New England. It has caused heavy rain in at least nine states. More than 100 people were evacuated due to flash floods in New Jersey, while others had to be rescued from their cars. This is the area where the storm came ashore. 96% of this town is still in the dark, and that's the case for tens of thousands of people across New England. Utility crews are now racing the clock because starting tomorrow, the temperatures are going to soar. They'll go over 90 in parts of Connecticut by Wednesday. Waves lashed the Rhode Island shoreline Sunday as Tropical Storm Henri made landfall with heavy rains causing transformers to explode and more than 140,000 homes in the Northeast to lose power. Stay at home, uh, stay off the roads. Rhode Island Let Governor Dan work. McKee said at one point more than 80,000 homes were without power in his state. It's a lot of wind and a lot of heavy rain and all of a sudden, boom. Irv Mazur lives in westerly Rhode Island where the storm came ashore. He says he felt his entire townhouse shake when fierce winds brought this tree down right onto his neighbor's roof. Just outside Hartford, crews were busy clearing roads of fallen trees. Further south in New Jersey, roads looked more like rivers as Henri left its mark in the town of Cranberry. Drivers throughout the state left their cars in the streets as homeowners assessed the flood damage right outside their doors. It's upsetting because it's going to be a lot of damage for a lot of people. Definitely. Cars are under and basements are wet, so it's, it's not good. And in New York, the storm swept boats ashore on Long Island after pouring nearly two inches of rain into parts of New York City Saturday night, potentially the wettest hour ever recorded there. Job 
36, 32. He covers his hands with lightning and commands it to strike. God will use lightning as part of the final judgment on mankind at the end of the seven-year tribulation, as we read in Revelation 16, 17, and 18. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake, as it had not occurred since men were on the earth. Much-needed aid arrives at a makeshift camp for victims of this month's earthquake in Haiti, which killed more than 2,200 people and destroyed or damaged more than 50,000 homes. The relief effort has been hampered by the insecurity that affects much of the country, with gangs hijacking aid trucks and stealing supplies. In this camp near the city of Lekai, scuffles broke out as people fought over handouts. Residents spoke of their despair. The situation isn't good. As you can see, it's raining. The sun is beating us. There's not a person who's living well. We all want to be back in our homes. It seems as though God has lifted his hand of protection from the United States, and not just the U.S., but the world as well. One of the purposes of the tribulation is to put an end to sin. And though we are not in the tribulation yet, God is withdrawing his hand, because who among us as individuals or as nations have not sinned? None. Romans 3.23 For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. These devastating events are not accidents, nor are they merely the natural cycle of things. The world is enduring events that are designed to bring about the end of days and cause us to repent. God is lifting his hand of protection from the nations of the world. No. Things will never get back to normal. They will only get worse. As the birth pains continue to become more frequent and more intense, one has to wonder, how close are we to the rapture and the seven-year tribulation? Joel 1.15 Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as destruction from the Almighty. What we are witnessing is just a glimpse of what the seven-year tribulation will be like. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. The U.S. is steadily evacuating people from Kabul airport, the desperate crowds pushing to get in, causing chaos. Twenty people have been killed around the airport, most in mass shootings and stampedes. Overnight, a clash outside as Afghan guards exchange fire with unidentified gunmen. One guard was killed in the clash, which involved American and German soldiers. The crowds are slowing down the evacuations. The Taliban are generally allowing people to reach the U.S. base at the airport, but now too many people are coming. The United States only wants to evacuate American citizens and Afghan translators and contractors. But a State Department memo obtained by NBC News says every time they open the gate, 150 non-approved people get in. An Afghan soldier was killed and three wounded in a firefight near the airport today. This amid credible threats that ISIS in Afghanistan is plotting attacks around the airport. The U.S. State Department is warning Americans not to try to get to the airport. U.S. military aircraft fire flares during takeoff, hoping to confuse possible heat-seeking missiles from the Taliban who surround the airport. Joe Biden insists he made the right decision and said the withdrawal would be messy no matter how it happened. I think that history is going to record this was the logical, rational, and right decision to make. But he's taking fire for not getting Americans out before withdrawing troops. U.S. citizen David Fox is stuck in Kabul with his wife and child, turned away after reaching the airport. The airport is very dangerous. So the Taliban enforcers have these, you know, big rubber bands. I think they're called like motor fan belts. I actually got whacked with um, 
you know, with one of these like, you know, fan belts for not moving fast enough. Desperate Afghans are taking desperate measures. This infant was handed to American troops over razor wire. The boy has been reunited with his father at the airport. This young girl was begging to be let in. My mother is coming. <laughs> Meanwhile, Vice President Kamala Harris on her trip to South Asia laughing as a reporter shouts questions about the debacle in Afghanistan. What's your response to reports of Americans? Oh, hold on, hold on. Slow down, everybody. <laughs> Republican leaders are calling out the administration for the catastrophe at the airport and a new and growing threat to the U.S. And this is an embarrassment on the world stage that Joe Biden has provided us. This has set us back decades. The Taliban now has more Black Hawk helicopters than Australia. Our mission in Afghanistan was to deny terrorists a sanctuary. And the Biden decision now to completely withdraw has handed them an entire country. Joe Biden now says the August 31st deadline to withdraw U.S. troops and evacuate civilians could be extended, but there's word the Taliban will not agree to it. Prime Minister Bennett says Iran is acting like a bully in the region and he wants the U.S. to get tough. I will tell President Biden that now is the time to halt the Iranians, to stop this thing, not to give them a rescue line in the form of re-entering a nuclear deal that has already expired and is not relevant, even to those who thought it was once relevant. Biden wants to re-enter the Iranian nuclear deal, but the talk stalled recently. Since then, Iran has a new hardline president and is rapidly advancing its uranium enrichment far beyond what was allowed in the original deal, the JCPOA. Israel says it's only a matter of weeks before Iran will have what it needs to make a nuclear bomb. Bennett says he has a plan for Biden. We will present an organized plan that we have built in the past two months to stop the Iranians in the nuclear dimension and in regards to its regional aggression. Former Israeli ambassador to the U.S. Michael Oren says one of the ways to stop Iran is by hitting its economy. Striking at its oil industry would hurt Iran. It doesn't have to involve civilian casualties, um, but you would, Israel could deal a very severe blow uh, to the Iranian economy. Oren tells CBN News this meeting between Bennett and Biden is crucial for Israel. Israel has to make clear to the United States, A, that it will never be bound by the Iran nuclear deal, that we'll never give up our freedom of action. He says Israel also needs to hear how the U.S. plans to enhance Israel's security should it re-enter the JCPOA. Because our security would be greatly impaired by the renewal of that agreement. And there are various ways by uh, improving Israel's capabilities, by various understandings with the United States, in which our security can be improved, albeit not 100 percent, because the JCPOA poses a strategic, if not existential, threat to this country. In the meantime, Israel is waiting to see what impact the turmoil surrounding the U.S. pullout from Afghanistan will have on the Biden administration's willingness to take a strong stand against Iran. As another piece of the prophecy puzzle falls into place, the impact that the American withdrawal from Afghanistan will have on Israel is prophetic. Afghanistan, led by the Taliban, will be one of the many peoples that come against Israel in the war of Gog and Magog. Ezekiel 38, 1-9 The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you out and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed in full armor, a great host, all of them with buckler and shield, wielding swords, Persia, Cush, and Put are with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all his hordes, Beth Garma from the uttermost parts of the north with all his hordes, many peoples are with you. Be ready and keep ready, you and all your hosts that are assembled about you, and be a guard for them. After many days you will be mustered. In the latter years you will go against the land that is restored from war, the land whose people were gathered from many peoples upon the mountains of Israel, which had been a continual waste. Its people were brought out from the peoples and now dwell securely, all of them. You will advance, coming on like a storm. You will be like a cloud covering the land, you and all your hordes, and many peoples with you. These are the modern-day nations in Ezekiel 38 and 39 that many people believe 
will be mustered in the latter years to attack Israel, Russia, Iran, Turkey, Libya, Sudan, and Ethiopia. As we can see by recent events, stage setting for the War of Gog and Magog is taking place as Russia, Iran, and Turkey are forming a dangerous alliance at the doorstep of Israel's border. God tells us exactly what will happen to Iran, Russia, Turkey, and the many peoples with you when they attack Israel in Ezekiel 38, 18-23, and 39-2, 7 and 8. And it will come to pass at the same time, when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath I have spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother, and I will bring him into judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. And I will turn thee back, and leave but the sixth part of thee, and will cause thee to come up from the north parts, and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. So I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them profane my holy name any more. Then the nation shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Surely it is coming, and it shall be done, says the Lord God. This is the day of which I have spoken. I've been informed by top-ranking military officials that Israel has been unable to launch even a single plane in defense. As I stand here, fighter planes are exploding in midair. They're crashing and falling to the ground without any explanation. And while no one can seem to give me any reason for why this is happening, I can tell you this. This all-out, unprecedented attempt to destroy Israel appears to be failing. God is the one who fights this battle for Israel. He does it for two reasons. To make his holy name known in the midst of his people Israel, that the nation shall know that he is the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Zechariah 2, 8 and 9. For thus says the Lord of hosts, He sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. For surely I will shake my hand against them, and they shall become spoiled for their servants then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Israel is precious to Almighty God, the apple of his eye. He is simply saying, you touch my chosen nation Israel, you poke me in the eye. Is Vladimir Putin, the infamous Gog of Magog, that the prophet Ezekiel warned would come on the scene in the last days and lead a coalition of nations to destroy Israel? Or could Gog be Recep Tayyip Erdogan, another dictator, who is fast gaining power and dominance in the Middle East? Biblical scholars can't agree if the prophet Ezekiel was talking about a last day's assault on Israel being led by Russia or Turkey. Many popular Bible teachers claim that Gog will come from Russia, while others claim that Ezekiel's prophecy actually points to Turkey. Whether Gog is from Russia or Turkey, both nations are presently being led by undisputed dictators who could each very easily fit the Gog profile. Luke 12, 54-56 then he also said to the multitudes, Whenever you see a cloud rising out of the west, immediately you say, A shower is coming, and so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say, There will be hot weather, and there is. Hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it you do not discern this time? Jesus was rebuking the multitudes for not recognizing the times they were living in. Jesus, the promised Messiah, was standing right there before them, and they didn't even know it. If the multitudes of Jesus' day missed Jesus' first coming, how much more important is it for us today to discern the times we live in and make sure we don't miss the signs of his second coming? The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear, that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. 
admit that you're a sinner. B, believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C, call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. When a person comes to know Jesus as their savior, they are brought into a relationship with God that guarantees their salvation as eternally secure. To be clear, salvation is more than saying a prayer or making a decision for Christ. Salvation is a sovereign act of God whereby an unregenerate sinner is washed, renewed, and born again by the Holy Spirit as we read in John 3.3 and Titus 3.5. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. When salvation occurs, God gives the forgiven sinner a new heart and puts a new spirit within him, as we read in Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. The Spirit will cause the saved person to walk in obedience to God's word, as we read in Ezekiel 36, 27 and James 2, 26. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So what about repentance? Repentance is not a work we do to earn salvation. No one can repent and come to God unless God draws that person to himself, as we read in John 6:44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Repentance is something God gives. It is only possible because of his grace. All of salvation, including repentance and faith, is a result of God drawing us, opening our eyes, and changing our hearts. God's long-suffering leads us to repentance, and so does his kindness, as we read in 2 Peter 3.9 and Romans 2.4. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Ephesians 2.8-9 declares, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Works are not the cause of salvation. Works are the evidence of salvation. Faith in Christ always results in good works. The person who claims to be a Christian but lives in willful disobedience to Christ has a false or dead faith and is not saved. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. That is why John the Baptist called people to produce fruit in keeping with repentance, as we read in Matthew 3.8. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. A person who has truly repented of his sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of a changed life as we read in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. A person who has not repented of their sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of the works of the flesh, as we read in Galatians 5.19-21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. A person who has crucified the flesh and belongs to Christ will give evidence of the Spirit, as we read in Galatians 5.22-24. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Believers are born again, regenerated when they believe. For a Christian to lose his salvation, he would have to be unregenerated. The Bible gives no evidence that the new birth can be taken away. The Holy Spirit indwells all believers, as we read in John 14:17. The Spirit of Truth 
whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. The Holy Spirit baptizes all believers into the body of Christ, as we read in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For a believer to become unsaved, he would have to be unindwelt and detached from the body of Christ. John 3.15 states that whoever believes in Jesus Christ will have eternal life. If you believe in Christ today and have eternal life, but lose it tomorrow, then it was never eternal at all. Hence, if you lose your salvation, the promises of eternal life in the Bible would be in error. Scripture says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Remember, the same God who saved you is the same God who will keep you. Once we are saved, we are always saved. Praise God, our salvation is most definitely, eternally secure. Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready.